today we'll try to cover Colossians chapter 2 verses 1 to 19. The little portions I have skipped in chapter 1, don't worry, when we get back to be summarize the whole thing, I'll pick up the threads. Now, in Colossians chapter 2, we are introduced to a set of false teachings or the kind of threats that the church was facing which Paul hears about through his friend Epaphroditus. And Paul makes it very clear. It's not a church that he has planted. He has not seen them face to face. He only has heard about it and then he corrects them or tries to bring them back to the good, perfect gospel that was preached to them through their pioneer leader. So please turn to Colossians chapter 2. It's kind of a virus alert. What was the nature of the problems that were hitting the church in Colossae? Now, it may appear to be diverse. There are philosophical challenges, definitely. And another aspect of it is some people were trying to push down Jewish spiritual formation. Basically trying to bring these believers in Christ to a Jewish discipline. What does it mean to be God's holy people? They would say to be God's holy people, you must become a child of Abraham for which faith is not just sufficient. You need to take circumcision and practice the Mosaic laws. So that was it. And there was another dimension. And that is, these leaders had special spiritual experiences. So they were trying to promote that. All things put together, earlier on, scholars used to say, it's kind of a composite philosophy. It's like you make a flower garland. Now, you can make a garland out of just jasmine flowers. Isn't it? Or you can pick various flowers and make a harem with that, isn't it? <laughs> so is it a, a garland made of uh, uh, several flowers or is it a singular philosophy? Or does it have multiple colors in it? I am persuaded now to accept that in all likelihood, the whole thing was kind of a Jewish package, something like that was threatening the church in Antioch, where Paul had to argue very vigorously, something like what had gone into Galatia, and Galatia is not that far away from Colossia and Laodicea and Hierapolis, and Paul hears about this uh, promotion of something that is fascinating to the hearers, promoted by very zealous advocates. Paul is afraid that the same kind of a challenge to the gospel through Jesus Christ that he experienced in Galatia is going to infiltrate the churches in Colossia. So the alert is basically to a kind of Jewish missionary activity which would have told these people your faith in Jesus is not just sufficient you need to have extras Christ is not alone but you need Christ plus some extras side dishes are important now that's the summary of it let's look at it look at chapter 2 and verse 4 he senses that there is some deceptive teaching in the air and he wants them in verse 4 I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments it is a very delusive deceptive from the first major attempt to sidetrack people it is deception is the strategy of the devil you know, the first couple, they are deceived, deceived into going away from the 
way of life designed for them by God in the garden of uh, Eden. So deception. Now deception can come in the appearance of truth, but it will be packaged with subtleties of fine nuances. It may look like a good, freshly caught fish, but it may have been three months old and preserved by a lot of life-threatening chemicals in it. It appears to be nourishing, it appears to be fresh, but there are concoctions or there are subtle ingredients in it which are dangerous. So the teaching that was being promoted there had was packaged with very cunning or deceptive arguments. Speech and when it is very persuasively presented, words are very powerful. Suppose somebody tells you that you are good, you did a good job, don't you feel happy about it? Suppose somebody says, that's very good, but. So usually in my classes, when I appreciate a student and say, that's a good question, or this is a good piece of work, they are waiting to hear, after all the goods, my buts. <laughs> so, uh, my children once told me, Daddy, you should learn to appreciate people without your butts. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, the people are very happy to hear somebody affirming us. It was an excellent performance. We are very happy to hear that. But then, you know, if you work at this, you may improve it. Isn't it? Now, speech which affirms has the ability to build us. Suppose somebody said, affirms us, appreciates us, it builds us. Suppose somebody says, what good is there? What is very special about it? <laughs> or, okay, it's just okay, there is nothing good. See, you would have spent six hours preparing a meal. And uh, your wonderful guest says, how is the food? Okay. <laughs> there is no appreciation. That okay is very disheartening, right or wrong. <laughs> or, or, you have worked so hard to make a fantastic meal, but while you were giving finishing touches to it, the baby started crying and you ran to pick up the baby. Lo and behold, there is a slight uh, the smell and flavor of a burnt offering coming. <laughs> Isn't it? It's not intentional. You didn't want it. The effort has gone uh, very much into it. Your recipe was excellent. You did all the right things, but at that critical moment, the baby. Has it not happened to any hostess here? Isn't it? Suppose the guests have come and your wonderfully honest and candid husband, he only knows how to speak the truth and only the truth. He tells you, Elizabeth, this is a fantastic meal, except that you have treated me like a god today by offering me burned offerings. You know, your guest is kind of... Uh, uh, tolerating it and saying, this is very nice, very nice, very nice. And your husband has to expose you. Is there going to be World War II or three in that home? I leave it to your guessology, power to guess. You see, words have the power to build. Words have the power to destroy. So when I present an argument or somebody presents an argument, very logically, sometimes using very gentle speech, affirming speech. You know, words have the ability to carry you along. See, we enjoy very logically presented arguments and if it is seasoned with humor, wit, uh, excellent presentations, you see, we sit kind of glued to the speech and the ideology. So, these people had very subtle teachings. It was not error up front. And they had very powerful, persuasive rhetoric or speech. And Paul calls it a captivating philosophy. Now, when you think of philosophy, don't immediately think that Paul was attacking the use of Socrates or Aristotle or some great thinker or a philosophical system and saying that Christians should not read or study anything other than the Bible. It's not that. 
Philosophy in the ancient world will stand uh, for any organized teaching. An excellent example of the diversity of this word philosophy is a Jewish historian who was trying to promote or explain what it means to be a Jew to the Roman elitist groups. His name is Flavius Josephus. Josephus in describing Judaism of his time says, there are four philosophical schools among us. Sadducees, Pharisees, the Essenes, and then of course the other one he calls the fourth philosophy, which is the group of people who went for armed resistance, something like uh, religiously motivated Maoists or something like that. Now, so an ideology of a religious group can be called a philosophy. Now, so it's very captivating. Look at chapter 2 and verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive. It can enslave you. You see, ideologies have the power to absorb people, shape people, shape their destinies and practices. I don't know whether you have ever toyed with other ideologies as you grew up. In my younger days, students or uh, teenagers would toy with all kinds of ideas. I had a friend sitting next to me in college. He was toying with ideas of existentialism. And he would often tell me there is no meaning in life. There were others who tried to convince me to become a Marxist. I have spent sleepless nights discussing Karl Marx in my hostel. When my friend would try to make me a Marxist, I would try to make him a Pentecostal. So after three years of intellectual conflict, my friend was kindly rescued. He did not become a committed believer, but I think today he is a believer. I won't name him. Later he once shared in a public seminar, if I have remained a Christian, there are two people responsible. One is my crazy Pentecostal friend, Edie, and the other is Father George, of course, who was his spiritual mentor. Now, so... People toy with ideas and ideologies. There was a time I thought the best thing as an Indian I could do was to be a Gandhian. And one of my friends came to me and said, Idi, you first be a Christian before you become a Gandhian. And in this teenage conversations, the Lord used my friend to lead me to Christ. So philosophies, it is not that you should not consider ideologies. But these are captivating. An ideology can captivate a teenager and shape his life. This is why sometimes some of these uh, fundamentalist ideologies allure people and turn them into terrorists. People become function like human bombs. Why would they do that? They would do that because of the captivating power of ideologies. Paul says, now, these philosophies have the power to captivate, so be careful. And then there is a pun on the word. Look at verse 8 itself. Philosophy, deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, not according to Christ. Now, being led astray, he uses a word which is a pun on the word for the Jewish assembly. Once I went to teach in some place. I don't know where it is. And you know the pastor or the leader of that program was promoting young people. And I think one young man had a lot of homework that he did. And probably there was a bet. And the Lord taught me what it means to forgive people. Uh, so he says, today we have uh, Somebody from da 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 da, and then he said his name is Dr. Idiot Sharian Nainan. I'm sure he has rehearsed it. Okay, what did he do? He was playing with my name. When you play with somebody's name, 
you think of adding a letter or removing a letter and then you find you know sometimes a son may become a pig <laughs> just by an addition of a, a vowel or a removal of a vowel okay fine so the greek word for pig is hos and the greek word for son is huios no because king herod was such a brutal king who killed lot of his sons even heirs who were appointed as his successors he would kill them so much so that uh, it is said that the roman emperor augustus caesar said i would rather be a pig in herod's house a horse rather than his son pius because out of his respect for jewish sentiments he will not slaughter pigs but if you are his son he will kill you <laughs> if he is suspicious now that is just a play on words here there is a similar play on words synagogue synagogue or the synagogue or the jewish gathering the community with a slight change change n into l it is being led astray so there is a pun on the jewish philosophy so jewish sex jewish communities or promoters of jewish spirituality paul says their teaching is empty and deceitful why is it considered as empty it is empty because it is not filled or saturated with christ later on he'll say they are a shadow of the things to come it's only the shadow and christ is the body can you weigh a shadow you can weigh a body isn't it isn't it these are just shadows then shadows are in a sense contentless empty empty and they are deceitful paul would say they are of human origin they do not come from god or they originate in human reasonings they do not originate from god and they are not attached to christ and to say that their origin is not from god he would say they are of the elemental spirits of the universe that's a technical phrase there are basically two ways of understanding it elemental spirits can basically mean the basics or the rudimentary primary tools of studies now your mother would have used perhaps an abacus board to teach you how to count isn't it colorful beads so she would uh, teach you to count addition and subtraction by making you move the beads right or wrong is anybody carrying their abacus board to the engineering college it was necessary at a time now when you started to learn cycling or when you learned swimming you know you would have had balancing wheels now that you are going to a cycle race do you still use balancing wheels extra wheels were necessary to help you learn to ride a bicycle in fact your bicycle was not a bicycle it was a tricycle <laughs> or a four wheeler isn't it with those extra wheels but then we graduate out of it so the primary elementary basic lessons these do not originate from god are not christ resource they are out of human origin or out of the basic principles of humanity so though he would call them shadowy or deceitful he would say still there is any wisdom in it that belongs to the elementary classes that's one way another way of looking at the stoicheia or the what is called as the elemental spirits is to see them as spiritual powers put it this way ancient world believed that 
behind physical realities there are spiritual realities behind power structures you know today we have secularized it we'll say it's the climate of opinion see fashion ideologies what is freedom what is life how do you choose a life partner you know my wife and i visited recently a certain place and when we were there students were very inquisitive and they asked sir tell us your love story how did you meet each other so i looked at my wife and said why don't you start she said look we have seen each other before our marriage but it was a perfectly arranged marriage and that is the end of all inquisitiveness suppose we had a story which resulted in you know parents oppressing and uh, our eloping they would have had you know been so enriched by all the masala that we could give them they found it was too spiceless isn't it uh, too holy a marriage to enquire further about it. so what am i trying to say there is a climate of opinion there was a time if somebody would discuss about dowry and inheritance that was acceptable arranged marriages were acceptable today we teach asking for a dowry is an evil thing so climate of opinion has changed now behind philosophical systems what sometimes we call as the market will decide it what is the market is there a spirituality to market elemental spirits is a way to say what is visible outside it may be a culture it may be value systems it may be traditions it may be institutions it may be slavery it may be patriarchy it may be a competitive economy or it could be a controlled economy whatever behind all these mega systems there are spiritual powers which control and direct them so these are two one is a very secular understanding it is the basics or rudimentary philosophical systems or to think that there are spiritual powers which control human corporate values or community values or principles so it can be behind the empire it can be behind the market see every group will have its own cultural practice what is acceptable and not acceptable isn't it so these are called corporate values now behind these there are supposedly spiritual powers so paul would say how much ever captivating these philosophies would be they do not have their origin in jesus christ they do not come from god they are human teachings and they belong to either powers in opposition to god or they are from the basics of human society so paul would go on to say these teachers and their philosophies have two defects one they are detached from christ it's not associated with christ that is not integrated with christ christ is not the head of it in our hymn when we looked at colossians 1:15 to 20 we saw god has appointed him to be the head over all things if jesus is the head over all things if in him all the wisdom and knowledge of god would live in a bodily fashion these philosophies are disconnected detached from christ secondly they have an inferior or defective vision of christ himself i have tried to classify the defective vision of christ in this way first they do not understand that jesus is unique he is not like other divine agents he is not like other gurus let me say 
how Jesus is different and how they are faulty in uh, comparing Jesus to be one of their class. Number one, Jesus does not belong to the inspired model. You see, this is where good religious teachers are. They are inspired. Inspired or with a vision, with an ideology, with a spirit. For example, the prophets of Israel and the word of the Lord came to so and so. So God's vision and God's spirit and God's word inspires a prophet. Jesus is not a prophet who is elevated to the omega point. The best of the prophets. The prophet who is to come. Jesus would claim. Behold, someone greater than a prophet is here. He is indeed a prophet, but he is greater than a prophet. Second, he is not a human being who has reached, again I am using this phrase, the omega point of self-actualization. This is what Eastern philosophy says, isn't it? Don't say that human beings are sinners. The greatest sin is to tell a human being that he is a sinner. That's what some of the Eastern teachers have said. Who then are you? Oh, human beings have the divine spark in them. There is divinity in them. All you need to do is to discover who you are and develop yourself. So the development of the mind or the discovery of your true identity and using X or Y meditation or exercising or discipline will help you to climb up to that fullest potential of being a human being or a self-actualized perfect human being. See in the corporate world today, this kind of philosophy of actualization has great value in your HR trainings. Motivational speakers will come and tell you, don't say I can't do it. You can do it. You have not developed your mind. Your intellect, your mind has not been developed even 2% of its potential. If you follow this particular practice or set of disciplines or exercises, then your memory will develop. You know, with students and exams coming, how much of market consumption these philosophies will have? Jesus is not a human being who is the most actualized human being. Jesus is not a demigod. Half God and half man. You see, there are so many such demigods in the world. He is not half God and half man. Yes, he is filled by God. In chapter 1 and verse 19, we read like this. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Yes, that is a partial truth. He is also filled with all the wisdom and the knowledge of God, discernment of God. Chapter 2 and verse 3. He is filled. Yes, that is there. That he is inspired. That he is a prophet. That he was an ideal human being. Yes, God has deposited his goodness, his wisdom, his knowledge, his spirit, his power in him. Yes, but he is not just that alone. In the inspirational model, chapter 2 and verse 9, we read, In him, all that is of God has a physical bodily existence. All the fullness of God lives in him in a bodily pattern. He is God walking as a human being. There is nothing negative. There is no minus in him. He is God, the Godhead, the goodness, the being of God, the power of God, the essence of God in human body shape. So, 
they had a very faulty vision of Christ and we'll come back to this towards the close of it. The teachers had, you know, the cunning, deceptive teachers. What were they teaching? They said in chapter 2, verse 9, Gospel's offer is not sufficient or perfect. That is why Paul gives a corrective statement. You are filled or you are complete in him to show that the gospel is not sufficient. You need to add it to it. There should be extras to it. You need essential extras. What are the extras that they were trying to mark? Number one. If you really want to belong to God, to be God's family, said circumcision is required. Jewish circumcision to show that we are members of God's family. The next, it's not just faith in the Messiah that is needed. You need to take the yoke of Moses or the yoke of the Torah. You must be united to the Torah. You must follow the legal disciplines of the law of Moses. See, they thought uh, in their past, their uncircumcision, they are called the uncircumcision. The uncircumcision can stand for Gentile sinners in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 50. Jews versus Gentile sinners equated as uncircumcision. They would also say, look at your past life. You've made so many mistakes. And you know, some of us are very boastful about this. One day I was sitting in a worship meeting, multi-denominational, and a fellow came and shared his testimony. There is no sin listed in the Bible which I have not done. An elderly uncle was sitting next to me and he said, Edie, I am scared to give a, take this fellow to my church. And then we had a conversation. You see, there are some people when they tell about their past Christless life, there is a sense of shame. There is a sense of grief. It's not like they are parading. You know, how great hunters they were. No, it's a shame. In their days of ignorance, they have insulted God and they have hurt other human beings. That is a matter of remorse for them. If somebody is told, you have made this failure, this failure, this failure, this failure. There is a long list of failures. Paul takes this as kind of a, you know, your credit card statement. We all like credit cards, don't we? Because it's very convenient, isn't it? Digital payments, very, very convenient. You know, when the problem comes, the monthly statement comes. And you find that your income is so much and your expenditure is three times. And you begin to wonder, you begin to wonder, how come, how come? You see... The credit card fellow has given you a limit far beyond your salary. Isn't it? And he's encouraging you, spend, spend, spend. You get that bonus, this bonus, this discount, that discount. You eat there, you buy there. So there is an encouragement to make you spend beyond your income level. And then he is very faithful, extremely faithful. The... 10 rupees that the petroleum company returned to you is also shown there. He does it, he's very honest. But when the total list comes, you owe the company three times your monthly salary. See, this is something called an I owe you certificate. Your credit card company will send you every month regularly on the billing date and they give you some extra time to pay also, isn't it? Isn't it? So there is a grace period also and they will very faithfully remind you and they'll keep gently reminding you that you owe them money. Now look at our moral life. Last week, 
Is there anybody who has not done anything imperfect in their lives? You may not have killed or done major mischiefs, but at least have you done all the things that we promised God we will do? No. Suppose these deficiencies are listed as if in a credit card statement we have large accounts to settle so there is this consciousness or awareness of their failures and then of course in the world everywhere you look there is some evil spirit or the other now you look at the uh, conceptions of people people buy newspapers or periodicals which have what the stars foretell and a lot of people instead of checking whether a would be husband and wife's bride and groom's blood groups match whether there is a ideological convictional what is it uh, compatibility they look at the stars horoscopes isn't it now even christians in certain parts of the world consult horoscopes predictions suppose there is something not happening properly there is ill health or failure immediately you want to consult somebody who can give you the reason for that now look charms protective charms are worn by people to protect them from evil powers then of course there is the concept of what is pure and impure you know touch not eat not taste not look not you know think not all this you know the monkeys are extended <laughs> it is not see not hear not speak not it will be touch not lot of kinds of extensions of the preventive power of gandhi ji's monkeys okay now and then of course some others will say you need extra you need to have a particular kind of god experience hasn't anybody come and marketed to you their wonderful stories of visitations and how angels speak and all i believe in angels i really believe in angels and you know when angels help me the most it is to find lost property <laughs> i sometimes tell god like this lord i have misplaced it somewhere i don't know would you kindly send that specialist angel and show me where it is or ask him to keep it on my table <laughs> because i am very forgetful but if i try to market to you promote you have you seen an angel have you seen jesus have you had this kind of an experience you know i got that experience when i was on a 21 day fasting and on the 17th day i got it so that means oh pastor got it on the 17th day then i must also get it on the 7th see we try to promote our spiritual experiences which sometimes are unique you know some of our best experiences are not meant to be shared am i right or wrong it is the privacy of our experiences that make our relationships very valuable am i right or wrong husbands and wives parents and children we don't just go and declare on every stage what are the euphorias of our relational experiences likewise paul says you know when he describes his ascent to the third heavens he is very reluctant to give greater details he was never marketing it so you may have unique experiences and if you tell somebody you are inferior because you don't have that experience you are inferior because you are not circumcised you judge people you judge people on their eating habits on their dressing habits their cultural freedom we try to impose our culture on them that these are all additions to the gospel paul would call these as subtle deceptions he would say it's not according to christ look at 19 they don't hold fast to the head 
or it is not integrated these are not assimilated or brought under the lordship of jesus jesus does not rule over them they are not coming out of him who is jesus he is the one who has reconciled all things in heaven and earth to god if it is not part of the reconciler himself then it has no value and paul goes on to say in chapter 2 verse 18 they have a shape of false humility humility is something which we can really act we can judge people because they don't have our expressions of humility we will be judgmental on people and you tell them that he or she this brother or sister is less than what you have attained now when you look at somebody with your own perspectives or preferences or glasses and you fail to see somebody as located in christ this is it you see an individual or a community through you and not through christ i wish i had time to show you the number of times in this letter paul uses the phrase in christ in jesus in the lord it is that placement in him sharing his life and destiny that makes us different so when we compare people and judge them because they are not like us when we sometimes get into visionary details don't you share your dreams with people at least young children let us be honest how much of a dream do you remember every time you narrate a dream there is an extra addition feeling going to it we keep adding to it now those of us who share our fantastic conversion testimonies can we be honest you are sharing your testimony 21 years after your conversion but now you bring your 21 years of biblical knowledge and ministerial experience to interpret a baby's childish experience you had at that time you could not even narrate it i was recently reading uh, john stott's authorized biography for a reference work and what touched me was john stott narrating some of his earlier experiences and he would say i can't say this is exactly how i would have prayed at that time i must admit my present day is understanding colors my narration but it could have been something like this the integrity of a person as a mature christian to say if i narrate my earlier experiences i am going to allow my later knowledge and experience and understanding to color it see when people get into visionary details there is this kind of sorry adding frills to it or embellishments when we narrate an experience it's like that isn't it some people never narrate details so those of us who are gifted with the ability to narrate experiences we put extra masalas into it right or wrong so when you describe how your parents were disciplining you well they were strict they beat you they made you stand uh, in the cold my father used to punish me like this sometimes in our village those days there was no electricity <laughs> no power supply kerosene lamps that's how we study my father will say go and stand in the courtyard that was the worst punishment i could get you know 10 minutes would be like endless ages <laughs> yeah, you are so scared because when you see a fly when you hear a bird when you hear a cricket or uh, something you think it's a devil nobody is allowed to breathe every whisper is so loud and clear 
to me they were endless endless eternal uh, punishments so i was just waiting ah come inside i would have been happier if he had given me uh, spanked me because it's then over isn't it cry for 10 minutes you become the victim and then you get over it no my father has been a disciplinarian do you know we grew up to be best of friends i would freely go and share with him my feelings or thoughts or ideas uh, my father would discuss my sermons study programs you see i cannot understand when some people say oh i was abused as a child no i don't want to laugh at you don't no, no. but you look at these narrations i was abused as a child my parents were very strict my father never told me you are good or never appreciated me look get over it get over it see we have a tendency to add frills to our hurts visions religious experiences and narrations right or wrong fine paul says you know when they get into their details they are in their false humility in their exposure as hurt abused people or privileged people there is a hidden boastfulness or they are puffed up their mind is carnal and boastful and they delight in the shadows more than in the substance well having said this paul tells them to look at the gospel jesus and their own privilege in it through the gospel chapter 2 and verse 10 you have been filled and the king james version translates it like this you are made complete there is no shadow there is no deficiency whatever is necessary for your salvation acceptance before god has been done by god by incorporating us associating us or absorbing us into jesus in jesus god has filled you it doesn't deny the need for growth maturity uh, to be transformed into the image of christ that's what we are going to look at when we come to chapter 3 being clothed with christ we will look at it but he says look but as far as your eternity is concerned as far as your standing with god is concerned as far as your relationship with god is concerned christ has done it and god has made it perfect there is no need for another one to work on it no additions to christ chapter 2 verse 11 we have been circumcised with a circumcision not made by hands but by the circumcision of christ something which god does something you know not made made by human hands the accusation was you gentiles are uncircumcised he says look when we are united with christ when we join christ in our union with christ god administers that covenant incorporation that absorption into his people with legitimacy he says your baptism is a union with christ we die with christ we are buried with christ we are raised with christ and we share in the life of christ that is the genuineness authenticity of the spiritual circumcision which christ does to us in that we are not just members of a synagogue we are now in christ chapter 2 and verse 13 do you have a list a credit card i owe you list god has forgiven us the forgiveness given to us in christ is perfect the debt certificate i owe you certificate it is cancel it's like tearing it it is destroyed crossed out he nailed it to the cross 
our debts our failures have been nailed to the cross because when Christ died on the cross he died for us he became sin for us he died as our substitute the powers of evil have been disarmed and they are paraded as powerless suppose there is a terrorist threat india's elitist special protection forces come and they overpower this terrorist gang they are made to like on the ground isn't it their arms are taken off and their body is searched and they are handcuffed or if somebody surrenders how would they surrender you drop your arms and you put your arms hands up that is surrender he may have been a terrorist threatening school children but when the superior elitist forces have overpowered him he is disarmed and his weakness is displayed when the tv cameras make their shots isn't it when they uh, they televise it likewise god has made these powers which threatened humanity ruled humanity frightened humanity control systems he has disarmed them because in the cross christ became victorious over them so the evil powers are powerless because christ has triumphed over them in the cross he disarmed them and his resurrection is his celebration of victory over every other power therefore paul reminds us christ is enough for us let me give you some practical guidelines on it number 1 there are spiritual heroes and they have spiritual experiences we don't need to judge or condemn that your intimacy with god your ecstasy with god is not meant to be the norm for the church what is shared or given for us in the word becomes normative christ is the hero we need to have models we need to have uh, people mentors we need to have examples that we can follow but christ and christ alone is our hero second the practices of a good christian need not become normative for others it may have some value and unless leaders and models are rooted in christ and hold on to his supremacy there is this tendency of perfectionism people preach this gospel and then they say they would have some other human models they want to be like that uncle or this auntie now we don't evaluate their teachings do they still rely on christ do they promote christ do they project christ is christ their hero or is christ their equal we need to be careful do they hold on to that next rituals and disciplines have some value but when you impose it there are spiritual disciplines i grew up in an evangelical community as a young believer and we were taught the value of a quiet time but my grandfather taught us the value of family prayers but if you have a night shift and your wife has a day shift can you have your grandfather's uh, family prayer schedule you may discover some other way maybe you may have an extended time of family prayer on a holiday on a saturday when two of you are at home no look family prayers have their value quiet time has its value but i can't impose my private personal discipline upon a community they have their value likewise the old testament religious practices had their value then but they are not incorporated into the new covenant a greater danger is this the danger of guruism 
when i travel around meeting with young people something that frightens me is this once upon a time when i went to youth camps i would have young people come and ask me questions from the bible pastor uncle what does that bible verse mean what does this mean so some of the students really surprise you because of their biblical literacy you know today what students ask pastor uncle i listen to this particular guru who teaches me about developing my mental powers what's wrong with that i listen to this other television guru he is not a christian he is a jew what's wrong with that we had this particular uh, therapist visit our office and we have all registered for a particular type of yoga practice what's wrong with that you see where our culture is going they are being distanced from the text of god's given word to composite ideologies of human perfectionism how can you work on this particular individual and enable that person like there are gyms promoted for physical health and there are emotional gyms there are intellectual gyms psychic gyms which tell you if you go through such and such a discipline you become a perfect human being or actualization beware unless it is integrated into christ how much ever useful such a mechanism or a system may appear to be it will not result in moral transformation i don't need to expand it all you need is to evaluate my statement in the light of last two years raids upon some centers let me proceed we as christians should know we are in christ we are united with christ and christ lives within us we are in christ we are living with christ and christ has chosen to live in us therefore we need to be rooted and established in this relationship in christ into christ christ in me this mutual abiding christ in me and i in christ together with christ died with christ buried with christ raised with christ seated with christ and i will appear with christ we we'll look at it when we come to chapter 3 that absorption into jesus that is god's way of reconciling the lost world to himself it is our growth into christ in our rootedness in our establishment in our being built or confirmation in our growing steadily in this relationship that there is security for us there is fulfillment for us there is real life for us we need to be aware of deceptive philosophies and finally paul would say this is all god's free gift and so be grateful and we express our gratitude in our prayers we express our gratitude in our worship we come together as a grateful family to thank god to thank jesus to celebrate the gospel this is where christian worship services have to be christ centered god centered we praise god we thank god we celebrate we exalt who jesus is and what the gospel does for us through jesus when we declare that it becomes grateful celebration paul's answer to the colossians is to look at christ and to look at themselves as brought or incorporated into christ and i would like to summarize it like this christ is enough for me and we should together say christ 
is enough for 